What a magnificent word you've given us in John's first letter, dear God. And we pray now that you'd open our hearts and minds, that we can take into ourselves the good news and the challenge here, and discover the deep love and joy you wish for us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So six days a week, a mail truck comes down my street, and the friendly mail person deposits some mail in our mailbox. I go out and get it, and I've noticed something. Very few things that we get in the mail are bills, you know, companies that want something from us. We'll get a water bill and a sewer bill, but that's pretty much it. Most of our bills come through email. What we do get, by contrast, is stuff from people and companies that don't want something from me. They very considerately want to give me something. Like my mail wants to give me peace of mind by offering me the opportunity to buy life insurance to protect my family. My mail wants to help me save on my utility costs by offering to replace all the windows in my house. My mail wants to give me a better wardrobe, which I actually need, by sending me a catalog of the fine products made by Land's End. It's remarkable to me how thoughtful this all is, how many different people and companies are out there all wanting me to have a better life, and all I have to do is buy their product or service. Really, the world is admirably arranged, is it not? Well, the scripture that Pastor Katie read is a piece of mail also. It's a letter written by the Apostle John to followers of Jesus Christ towards the end of the first century. And he wants something for them too. He writes, we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. So that your joy may be complete. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds even better than new windows or life insurance or a new wardrobe. So let's dive into our reading here and discover how we find this joy, according to John, who knew Jesus perhaps better than anyone else while our Lord was on the earth. Now, when we hear the word joy, we often think of the experiences and activities that give us joy, like, like being at the beach on a beautiful summer day, puffy white clouds, blue sky, your feet in the sand, a good book in one hand and a cold beer in the other. Or joy would be being at an Orioles game at a great seat behind front plate, home plate. Joy would be celebrating your birthday with your children and grandchildren gathered all around you. Joy would be eating a croissant and drinking a cappuccino at an outdoor table at a cafe in Paris. Those kinds of things bring joy. But John says, if that we really want the joy that comes from God, the first thing we got to do is let the light of God interrogate what is hidden in darkness inside us. The pain and brokenness and wretchedness and confess it. Confess it. Now that seems a little bit like a buzzkill, doesn't it? Starts out with joy, then talks about the darkness within. But maybe, maybe he's on to something here. So I ask you to curb your disappointment and stick with me for a while. Now the first thing we got to do in understanding what John has to say is understand what sin really is. And well, that's simple, right? It's bad stuff that people do that harms them, harms other people, violates God's will. So list out the bad things you do, say you're sorry, and cut that out. Well, not so fast. We have, that is a very truncated and limited understanding of what sin is. I'm reminded of the story of the Catholic priest who was getting up in years and had grown very deaf and because of his deafness, he asked the members of his flock who came to him for confession to write their confessions on a slip of, slip of paper that they would hand to him to read instead of speaking to him. This practice worked pretty well until one day 
the father heard a heavily breathing man enter the visitor's side of the confessional booth and then fumble for a few minutes as a small crumbled piece of paper was passed through the curtain into the old cleric's hand. And this is what the confession read. Two cans of diced tomatoes, cold cuts, apples, whole wheat bread, toilet paper, coffee beans, and dishwasher soap. <laughs> the priest befuddledly looks at this list for a puzzled minute and then silently passed it back to the man. Suddenly there came an agonized voice from the other side of the confessional, Mother of God, I've left my sins at the supermarket. <laughs> Our mistake is to think of sin as just a list of naughty bad things I do or things I should have done that I didn't do. Lose my temper, pass on some juicy gossip, looked at some naughty pictures online, ignored someone who needed my help. And if we think that's the sum total of sin right there, we'll think repentance boils down to saying to God, God, please forgive me, I'll try harder. Well, I think all of us have tried that and we have found it doesn't really work, that we don't stop doing that thing entirely. In fact, thinking of sin only as a list of do's and don'ts can actually be really harmful. It leads to legalism and moralism. It leads to self-righteousness. If that's your conception of what sin is, then you come up with a list of things you should do and shouldn't do, and you end up with rules. Don't say naughty words. Don't think sinful thoughts. And then people think, if I just follow the rules, I'll be okay. But what you end up with is something that's the complete opposite of Christianity. You end up with a religion that's about re relig moral self-help, about trying harder. And what that produces is phoniness. Got to pretend I'm doing okay or else I'll be judged. What that produces is self-righteousness. I go to church and I obey the Ten Commandments and that makes me a good person. And it's just a small step from there to becoming self-righteous and then scorning and despising people who you think aren't up to your lofty standards. Bottom line, if you think sin is just a list of things you shouldn't do or should do, you might end up being a little better morally, but you will be a disaster spiritually. You'll end up further from Christ than when you started and you will get no joy at all from living that kind of life. Now here's what we got to do. We have to search for the sin beneath the sin. The reason we do the stuff that's harmful to us or we neglect the stuff we should be doing, that stuff that creates this gap between us and God, the sin beneath the sin. You have to move from the symptom, the bad thing we do, down to the cause. Now let's take somebody I know pretty well as an example. I don't want to use his real name. It would embarrass him. So let's call him Bot Scourman. How does that work? <laughs> For a long time, Mr. Scourman struggled with a profound sense of unworthiness, engaged in self-loathing. Now that's sin in that those things deny the image of God in that person, in that they rob that person of the joy that God wishes for them. And they're also sin in that they create a morose person who's not much of a positive witness to the gospel and not much fun to be around. So let's say this hypothetical person figured out this wasn't right. I need to repent of it. It's sin. It's not the good God wishes. So this person says to himself, it is wrong and sinful to feel unworthy, to allow self-loathing thinking and behavior. I must repent of that. Stop that bad Christian. Cut it out. Think that's going to work? Nope. What you end up with is more self-loathing because you can't stop self-loathing. What Mr. Scourman has to do is dig deep and go back to the roots of the problem. And that root was during childhood, he was told repeatedly that he was dumb, slow, funny looking, told repeatedly that he wasn't liked, was bullied, and he believed it, internalized it, and it warped and deformed him. 
He believed the lie that he was no good and it colored his life for years. Or take somebody who's racist. They hear racism is a sin and you need to love your neighbor, black, Latino, Asian, all people. Hearing that may cause some shame and thinking maybe you need to do something about that. But then the same thoughts and fears pop up when you encounter somebody different. What you got to do is, again, dig down deep and figure out where those thoughts and feelings originated. Maybe you were taught them by your parents, and to reject that way of thinking feels like rejecting your parents. Maybe you were mistreated by a person of a different race, and the deep memory of that trauma has made you instinctively fear and loathe all people of that race. Dana Ortland wrote, Every human we meet today is in pain, perhaps deep pain, beneath the surface, beneath the smiles. At the root of that, at the root of our sin, is almost always a lie, a fear, or a trauma. A lie, a fear, or a trauma. Now, it can take a long time to figure out what it is, but we must. And then we must take it to the Lord Jesus. That's the beginning of our healing. This is how it works. John begins that scripture reading, that marvelous reading, by saying of Jesus, referring him to the word of life, meaning Christ as the word of God through whom the universe was made. John says that this word, the majestic son of God, who is outside time, who is the creative agency and power behind the universe. John says, we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have even touched this word of life, Jesus Christ. Have any of you ever touched someone famous, shook hands with somebody important? Anybody? First service had nothing. I was so sad for them. Anybody? Okay, that's pretty cool. Desmond Tutu, you win. <laughs> Anybody else? I got to meet Lois Lowry, a, a writer. Okay, children's books? Uh, yeah, the Giver series. Good. Um, not Desmond Tutu. I, I'm, when I was like six, I made friends with a major league baseball player. Met whom? A major league baseball player. He made a Twitter post about me. Wow, that's out there for all eternity now. Cool. Ryan Seacrest. Ryan Seacrest. Who are you trying out? Yeah. <laughs> Bill? President Clinton. President Clinton. I was uh, living in South Carolina in 2012, and South Carolina is an early primary state, and because of that, the, the place is overrun with presidential candidates during that season. And South Carolina is a small state, so it's easy to go and meet them. Senator John McCain was speaking at the downtown Columbia Rotary Club, and I was a member of another Rotary Club. And my daughter and I went down to hear Senator McCain speak. My daughter was working on a research project about the different presidential candidates, and we got to hear him speak. And afterwards, I got to shake his hand, and that was an honor for me. Well, John said that he got to touch the word of life, Jesus Christ. So here's a trivia question that the first service failed miserably. What gospel did John write? Please, 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 somebody. Come on, somebody. John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? In his gospel, he writes the letter, he writes the Gospels. In his Gospel, John said that he was at the dinner table with Jesus and his disciples. And dinner tables back then were different than ours. They weren't raised up, they were low, about a foot off the ground. And you ate dinner while lying on your side, reclining on a cushion. And John said that at one dinner, he was reclining right next to Jesus with his head resting on Jesus' chest. In the King James, it says he was reclining with his head on Jesus' bosom. Now, that's a different culture, and still today in the Middle East, you'll see men walking together holding hands, and they're not same-sex couples. That's just something people do. They touch a lot more 
over there. The point is, the word of life, through whom all things were made, came so close, so near, that John was able to nibble olives with him at supper with his head on Jesus' chest. Close, intimate friendship with the second person of the Trinity. We can excavate and look at our deepest places of sin and shame. We can do that without fear because of who Jesus Christ is. He draws near to us. He loves us tenderly and personally. And in him there is no condemnation. You can show Jesus the most awful stuff you've done. The deepest places of pain you keep so carefully hidden. And he'll look on you with nothing but love. Have you done that? Have you trusted Jesus enough to let him love you like this? But one more step in the healing towards joy. Journey towards healing and joy. John writes, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But sometimes that language, that imagery can gross us out. Like the old hymn that goes, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I know it's a metaphor, but bathing in a fountain filled with blood, well, I find that kind of repulsive. And it's a little confusing, too. I mean, crucifixion was not a bloody death. You didn't die from blood loss. You died from suffocation and exposure. So why the emphasis on blood? Because the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ further exposes us. We talked about the sin beneath the sin. Now we're going to talk about the sin beneath the sin beneath the sin, which Christ exposes. The death of Christ exposes that our most basic problem is that we are lost and alienated from God, all of us. And it has warped and twisted us. And so we kill the Son of God. We all have blood on our hands. And that blood exposes that our worst problem is that we don't love God. We are at best indifferent or dismissive of God or maybe even hate God. But the blood of Christ also exposes God in a way. Exposes God as one who through his son made the unimaginable journey from heaven to the manger and then to the cross. To die a death where God takes into himself all our wretchedness and meanness and pain and alienation. All of it and forgives it and sets us free. We don't have to be afraid of God. He's shown us his heart. And it's a heart that takes into himself all our wounds and wretchedness. Nothing you have done, nothing you are can stop God from loving you. We are now children of God, John says elsewhere, if we trust in Christ. We are loved beyond imagining and nothing that life barfs up in our laps can separate us from God's love. And knowing that deeply and fully is what leads to joy. And joy is our destiny. A writer named Mark Judge attended a concert down in D.C. And during that concert, he experienced what he described as unashamed joy. Something we don't often see in this broken world. The scene was made all the more powerful because it included all kinds of different people from all over the world. A Nimipu Indian, a saddle maker from Idaho, a Brazilian street dancer, a leader of the music liturgy of the Ethiopian Christian Church, a bluegrass band, an Iroquois choir, a master of Peruvian folk art, a Korean dancer from New York, and a New Orleans jazz band. And he writes about this. After almost three hours, it was time for the curtain call. One last bow to end the evening. As the host of the event reintroduced everyone, the jazz band played When the Saints Go Marching In, and that's when something happened. The audience rose to its feet. 
It seemed at the time like one last blast of applause before the exit. But as they and then we clapped in time to when the saints go marching in, the performers on stage began to dance. The jazz band, sensing something was going on, got louder, kept playing and playing and playing. On stage, the performers formed a conga line led by one of the jazz musicians. Then a circle, each person taking his or her turn in the center of the circle. The invisible line between performers and audience evaporated. It had turned into one big party or revival meeting. Judge continues, I have never seen anything like what happened that evening. It was the most totally unselfconscious explosion of bliss I've ever seen. After about 30 bars of the saints go marching in, the host shut things down, but no one wanted to leave. I honestly believe the band could have played for another hour, and no one would have moved for the exits. Staggering outside, I heard a woman said she was swimming in joy. I was speechless. This was a time when language failed. Like everyone else, I just wanted to stay inside the joy. Inside joy is God's destiny for you. You are going to be caught up into a new creation where if you felt that joy now, your heart would explode. Joy unspeakable. And you can have a taste of it right now. You can get ready for the joy of the new creation by opening yourself fully and unashamedly to Jesus Christ, the Lord who has shown us his heart, and let him love you and heal you and forgive you. Amen.